One of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Nehemiah, said that the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm convinced that God wants us to be a joyful people. I hope you are. If not, stay tuned right now for Give Me the Bible. That's our topic this morning, Joyful People. Sunday is always that special time for us to get into the Word of God. And we're glad that you've joined us this morning for the Game of the Bible presentation. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on the Give Me the Bible program. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dan Manuel, your host for Give Me the Bible this morning, and thank you for tuning in. And we hope you'll stay with us now as we talk about this joy of the Lord that you and I ought to possess as God's people. And if you're not a Christian this morning, we appeal to your intellect and to your emotion uh, based upon the Word of God that you might surrender your life unto Christ and become a Christian because that's where joy really lies. When we read the New Testament, we read all of those accounts of conversion. One of the things that stands out is this, that when they were obedient to the gospel, they went on their way rejoicing. I hope this morning that if you're not a Christian, you'll listen closely to what we have to say about this joy that is in Christ our Lord. You know, the Bible teaches us many, many things about joy. The Apostle Paul said that we're to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. But yet we have so many people that are so negative in our world. One man told me the other day, he said he was born to be negative. And I said, why? He said, my blood type is be negative. Well, you know what? God doesn't want us to be negative. He wants us to rejoice. And we're going to talk about that over the next 30 minutes. So get your Bible, sit down, and study it with us. We're going to go to Paul Hillier right now. And uh, Paul, tell us of at least one of the things for which we ought to be joyful this morning. Well, Dan, I'd be glad to do that. And, uh, you know, we have so many blessings as, as Christians. And perhaps the, the greatest of all blessings is the fact that the Lord has redeemed us. He's redeemed us out of our sin uh, and, and given us a, uh, a hope of eternal life that we have through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, the, the word redemption or, or redeem is an interesting word. Uh, it's not a word that we might use just a whole lot just in our, our common vocabulary, but it's certainly used a lot in the Scriptures. Of course, most of us probably at some point have had some kind of, uh, uh, of, of redemption uh, uh, receipt or, or ticket where maybe you've purchased something and you're able then to, uh, to go and redeem that for, for what has been promised to you. And uh, as in a spiritual way, we recognize as we read through the Bible that uh, without Jesus, we were all lost. We, we were without hope because of our own sin, our, our, our own uh, iniquity that we've all committed in our life. Uh, and yet God allowed His Son Jesus to come into the world to die in our place to redeem us from our sin. And, uh, you know, with, with, without that redemption, without God's grace, we would be lost. We would be without hope. We would be headed for eternal condemnation. But the good news is that Jesus came and He took our place. Sin, according to the Bible, separates us from God, Isaiah chapter 59. The prophet says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sin has separated uh, him from you. And, and so we're thankful today because of, of God's love for us and his grace toward us in sending Jesus and Jesus taking our place and redeeming us from sin so that we can be saved. And, you know, just think about the physical things of life. And, and Peter, Peter tells us in, in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, uh, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, uh, but uh, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, as we go through this physical life, you know, we tend sometimes to hold on to those physical things, the gold, the silver, the, the money that uh, maybe we've accumulated over, over time. And we think, you know, what, what, where would I be without those physical possessions? Uh, and, and yet, uh, you know, when tragedy comes, often we're reminded, you know, those physical things really don't mean a whole lot. You know, even if I were to lose all my money, even if I were to lose all the gold and the silver that I possess, I'd still have my life. I'd still have my family. I'd still have a lot of good things. Uh, there'd still be a reason to live. Uh, you know, God didn't redeem us with those perishable things like that, but rather he gave up his only son. He gave up Jesus, his, his son, to come and to die in our place. 
and Jesus was willing to give up his life. He laid it down for us so that we could have this hope, so that we could know that we have eternal life with God. And then it's a great blessing, and it's a reason to be filled with joy to know that I've been redeemed. Just as we sing that song, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and that makes me smile this morning. I hope it does you too. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we all ought to be smiling this morning. We all ought to be happy uh, because God is blessing our life. And even when we feel that we haven't been blessed of God, we still need to rejoice in the Lord. You know, one of the great blessings that you and I have, and one of the things that ought to make us rejoice is the fact that someday we will rest from our labors. Now, many of us don't like to admit that we're getting old and that we're getting close to that judgment. Um, I know a lady who, uh, when it comes to her age, she's a little bit shy. <laughs> Matter of fact, about 10 years shy. <laughs> well, believe it or not, most people don't want to admit their age and that they're getting older, but you're getting closer to the judgment every day. But aren't you thankful when that time comes that you'll, as a faithful Christian, be able to hear the Lord say, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Joe, tell us about the fact that we really ought to be joyful because someday we will be able to rest from the pressures of this life. Dan, you're so right. And it's spelled out in Scripture uh, in, in so many different ways, but, but all pointing to that day when we're able to rest from our labors and have those burdens of this life taken away from that time forward to eternity. You know, my wife accuses me of waking up in a new world every day. And that, that's a blessing, and some days it makes me smile because the things of yesterday are just simply gone, and it's a new, brand new day today. But oh, how I long for the day when at some point that new day begins in the other side of eternity where Jesus and the Father will be with us from that day forward. In Matthew 11, Jesus speaks of an invitation. He offers an invitation that is just as viable today as it was the day he spoke it back in that first century time. He says in verse 28 of Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In verse 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What a wonderful invitation. The Lord gives us the metaphor here of someone who is struggling so hard to carry such a heavy, heavy burden that he must carry to a certain destination that the Lord says, yoke up with me, put on my yoke, and I'll help you carry that burden to its destination. Because if we try to continue to do it by ourselves through this life in this world, the heavier the burden gets, the tighter we become, and the further that end result or that end point looks, and, and we just kind of keep struggling to get there day by day by day. The Lord says, put my yoke on. I'll help you. I'll take that burden with you. I'll relieve you of that burden, and I'll give you rest. He also says in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, he gives us the idea of how we begin to put on that burden and what it takes to, or put on that yoke to have that burden relieved. And what it takes to do that, he says in Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many that go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, if, if you think about people in this life that, that you know, maybe yourself this morning, uh, as Dan mentioned at the beginning of the show, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you're still an alien sinner, uh, you have a sin burden. Uh, maybe this morning that finds you in a condition where you're penitent, that you're filled with some sort of amount of godly sorrow, that, that you've hurt God, that you've done wrong in your life. Uh, Jesus invites you to come and take that yoke. Come and let him give you the rest that he's willing and able to give you at the end of this life. And for you, the Christian, he continues to be our yoke partner as we walk through this life together with him, knowing that as you wake up in that new world one day, uh, it'll be a, a, a smiling time. Dan will worship God, praise him from that time forward. So all that uh, makes me grin this morning. How about you? Thank you, Joe. And you know, when one really confesses his faith in Christ based upon his belief and has a penitent heart, and he is baptized in water for the remission of his sins, and God again, like he did in New Testament times, brings joy into the lives of those folks. 
You know, a lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm carefree. I'll never, ever have any problems in life. I heard about a man one time who said to the woman he was going to marry, honey, he said, when we, he said I, w I will always be there for you in your times of sorrow and struggle. And she says, but I don't have any. He says, I said, when we get married. Well, believe it or not, every marriage has its struggles, its problems. Every life does. But I'm thankful that when we fail, that God is there to lift us up. I saw a little bumper sticker one time that said something that really is very, very important. It made the statement, it said that every setback is a setup for a comeback. And you know, with Christ, isn't that true? Chris Vidakovich, tell us about it. It's definitely true. And when you stop and think about the, the different problems that people had and the, and the times that they turned away from God and turned away from Jesus in the scriptures, uh, you also see the times that they were able to come back. I often think that the story about uh, Judas could be the greatest story about restoration uh, after the cross if he would not have taken his own life, but instead if he would have turned back to God. And then I think about what we think of as the greatest story, and that is the story of Peter. And we look at Peter, and after Peter had denied Jesus those three times, that he looks at Jesus, he makes contact with him, and he went out and he wept bitterly. But then even at the resurrection, when the young man was in the tomb, and he was looking, talking to the ladies, he said to them, go tell the disciples and Peter. And just giving that special message to Peter that Jesus wanted to be with him, wanted a relationship with him, wanted to talk to him again. And then I love the story of the restoration of, of Peter in John chapter 21. And there was really just this great message that we can't really see in the English, that we need to understand more in the Greek because of the different words for love. And one of the words is the, the agape love. We're familiar with that for the sacrificial love. And the other one is the phileo love or a brotherly love. And so Jesus goes to Peter in this great text and he talks to Peter and he said, Peter, son of Simon, Simon Peter, son of John, do you truly love me with a sacrificial love? That's what he asked him. Do you really love me with a sacrificial love more than these? And Peter answers him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother. He doesn't say that I love you with a sacrificial love because he proved he didn't. He ran away from Jesus at that time. But yet Jesus asked him for the sacrificial love and he says, no, I love you like a brother. And Jesus still says, feed my lambs. And then Jesus again says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me with a sacrificial love? And Peter answered him, yes, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. And Jesus still said, take care of my sheep. But then in verse 17, the third time he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me like a brother? He doesn't ask him this time about the sacrificial love, but he asks him if he loves him like a brother. And Peter was hurt because he asked him the third time, do you love me like a brother? And Peter answered, Lord, you know all things. You know from what I have shown you that I love you like a brother. And see, the message that we really need to hear is we've got to be honest with where we are. Now, there are times when we have strayed away from God. Well, let's be honest about it. And let's go before God and go before Jesus and recognize who we are and where we are, but realize that that's a starting point. You know, we've rejected God sometimes. We've rejected Jesus. We've moved away. We've denied Him in the way that we've lived our life or the things that we've said. But at the same time, Jesus comes to us and He still has a responsibility for us. I know where you are. I mean, He wants us to be honest with ourselves where we are. I know where you are, Jesus says. Let's start there. Uh, let's start in our relationship together and let's go on together and let's still feed the flock and do what I have called you to do. Dan? Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. And you know, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. It really, really is. And uh, you know, for some reason or another, however, there are a lot of people who want to have their name on the church roll or in the church directory, and they're more concerned about that than they are having their name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, you could be on the church roll and still not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, we're going to call on Randy Foreman, my good friend from over in Jacksonville, who preaches for the Corinth Road Church of Christ there, to help us understand that one of the things that really ought to make us joyful is when we know with great assurance that our name is written down in that great book of life. Isn't that true, Randy? It certainly is, Dan, and thank you once again for having me on the program. You know, we are to rejoice because our names are written down in heaven. Jesus makes it clear in Luke 10, 20 that there are superior grounds of rejoicing above that of devils being subject to you. 
He says, Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. Thank God for our place in the Lamb's book of life. Listen to the Apostle John in Revelations 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship Him, even those names that have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. You see, when sinful people believe, repent, confess Jesus as Lord, and are baptized to obtain the forgiveness of sins, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. God has written in the book of life that all who obey His commands of salvation will have their names written in that glorious record. Is your name written there? And notice in Revelations 3, 5 where Scripture records, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. He that overcomes literally is overcoming, which is a continuous action. What is He overcoming? Well, this points to a battle, a war, a struggle, and even a fight. Jesus wants His saints to be vigorously engaged in this fierce contest against wickedness. What are we to overcome? The answer is plain. We overcome self, the world, hostility and frowns and flatteries, indifference, and even death. When we overcome Satan and his mighty army. Brethren and friends, that is what the book of Revelation is all about. Overcoming a spiritual adversary who is smart and who is strong. Overcome, and your name will be engraved in the book of life, never to be removed. And Jesus Himself will confess you by name before His Father and before the angels, Matthew 10 and Luke 12. Now comes the universal judgment. Revelations 20 and 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The books that were open need to be identified, and this is especially true if our own individual judgment is based on what is written in those books. One of those books is the book of life, and it's mentioned several times in the Bible. And as we've indicated, it refers to the roster of the saved written by the authority of God. And so if your name is written there, then your crown of life is assured. If it's not written there, you will not be allowed to enter heaven. Therefore, we must so live that our name remains in that divine catalog of the redeemed. Dan? Thank you, Randy. And isn't that a real reason for us to rejoice? Those wonderful scriptures and those thoughts that were given by Randy this morning certainly enhance our joy. It does mine to be reminded of it every day that someday we'll be able to go and be with God in heaven. Now, Perry Cowan, I know also that one of the great blessings of life and one of the reasons for which we ought to rejoice uh, is the fact that God eliminates our past. He does. He washes it away. Uh, someone said that the past should never, ever be a hitching post, but a guidepost to the future. And I hope that's the way we will live our lives. God will help us to forget the past. He eliminates it as we move on into the future. Perry, share with us those thoughts this morning that can help us rejoice. Well, Dan, we certainly ought to be thankful for that, and we ought to rejoice over it because the sin in our past caused us to be lost. And, and in that condition, we had no hope. We were without hope when we had not Christ in our life. Uh, we ought to be thankful that God is a loving God, a compassionate God, uh, in addition to being a just God. Now, being a just God, uh, justice demands that, that our sins be paid for. And the Bible teaches us that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in that same book of Romans, it teaches us that the wages of sin is death. So because we've sinned and because the, the penalty for sin is death, uh, we're all under a death penalty. So we, we must be thankful and joyful that, uh, there, that there's a way for that to be in our past and be gone and forgotten uh, because of God's mercy. 
because of God's compassion, because of God's amazing grace, uh, justice is served by the blood of Christ because He sent His Son into the world that the world through Him might be saved. John chapter 3 and verse 17. Uh, for all who will obey His gospel, that is true. Now it, it's just for that group because the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 that He became the author of eternal salvation to all. But there's not a period. There it goes on and it says, to all who will obey Him. So the obedience is necessary. It's just like Samuel told Saul back in the book of Samuel uh, that uh, the, uh, obedience is better than anything else. Obedience is better than all the excuses you can make for the things that you've done. Uh, so if we are in Christ, our, our death penalty has been removed. It's been stayed. Uh, we were under the death penalty, but we've been released from it by uh, by the blood of Christ. Look at Romans the 8th chapter and the first verse where he says, There is therefore now no condemnation, no death penalty to those who are in Christ uh, because His blood has washed us clean. It, it's, it's cleansed our sins. And uh, note the conditions of that promise though. It's to those who are walk according to the Spirit not those who are walking according to the flesh. We must be walking in the way that God would have us to walk and we have to be in Christ. Now the Bible tells us one way to get into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27, Romans chapter 6, read those and you'll find that one way. And if you find in the Bible any other way to get into Christ, please contact us here on Give Me the Bible and make us aware of it because uh, I for one have not yet found any other way. The psalmist said in Psalm 78, Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. He said, deliver us so that we might have atonement. Be at one with you. God doesn't remember our former iniquities if we've obeyed the gospel and if we're walking in the Spirit. We have to be in His way, walking in His way, and I'm thankful that He has done that for me. Well, Perry, I'm thankful too, and that makes me rejoice. Well, in our closing segment here today, we want to go to Mark Engel. And uh, Mark, uh, would you share with us again uh, the idea that someday we'll be able to go to heaven? And, and that really makes me rejoice, and I'm quite sure that it would make anyone rejoice. Yes, Dan, thank you. We really should rejoice when we understand that <clears throat> our joy is a heavenly one. Revelation 22, 12 says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. It's important to draw a distinction between happiness and joy if we're really going to understand how to be joyful. You see, happiness is based on the circumstances of life. In other words, the difficulties, the sickness, the grieving times that we have. And all of us are going to have those times. Unfortunately, a lot of people set a goal of being happy, which is kind of unattainable because the circumstances of life rob us of those things. But you see, we can be joyful at all times, like Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. He said it enough so that he repeated it and said, uh, rejoice always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. And so if we understand that, we understand that jo joy is based on a choice that we make to follow God's will in our lives. Joy, I would also like to say, is based on an understanding of God's Word and an application of that Word in our life. And so as we set a goal to be joyful, it's to understand that we have a heavenly reward. You see, we need to understand if we're going to have a heavenly reward that we can have joy because we understand that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. In fact, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. And we, we can have a citizenship not here, although we live in this world, we don't have to be a part of this world. And as we live as the people of this world do in the flesh, we can understand we're on a journey that will take us to heaven. In fact, it'll take us a lifetime to get there. Now that lifetime might be a little longer for some people than for others, but it always takes a lifetime to get there. 
So this journey that we're on, this citizenship that we have can be likened to what uh, Abraham was searching for in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 10, when it says he was searching for a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And so we're searching for that same city, a, a city that has foundations, one that is not dependent upon being built by the hands of men. And see, the church is not uh, based on the building that we meet in, but it is the people that meet there who have a like and precious faith, the people that have a joy because of the gospel that has been given to them and the opportunity that they have to go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare that place, I will bring you to me. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. We can, uh, we can rejoice always when we're not overly discouraged. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, we're told <clears throat> that light and momentary difficulties uh, produce for us an eternal weight of, joy, uh, of glory far beyond all comparison. And so brethren, <clears throat> it's important to understand that we can have a joy because of the reward we have in heaven. Thank you, Mark, and thank all of you for joining us today for our telecast. We're certainly grateful to all of our panelists for reminding us of the joy that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, I hope that you'll join us next week at the same time right here on this Fox and NBC affiliate as we uh, search the scriptures and find that joy that God has for all of his children. I'm Dan Manuel saying thank you again for being with us and join us next week for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out, ring it out, ring out, barely ring the word. Speed it away, or man, message she might, and she, send it today, still far from Jesus, when he live in sight. Lost and lost in the dark, darkness and doubt, ring out, barely ring the new. Wonderful news that makes men free, happy and free, to all the free. lost of every nation, bring the message out, bring it out, tell the world of saving grace, make it known in every place, bring it out, bring it out, bring it out, bring it out, help the needy ones to know him from whom all blessings flow. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out, ring out, barely ring the word, speed it away, Lord, man, yes, it's your mind, and see, send it today, still far but from Jesus, when he live in sight, lost and lost in doubt, darkness and doubt, ring out, barely ring the news, wonderful news, that makes, making him free, makes men free, happy and free, to all the lost of every Nation, bring the message out. Sin and doubt to sweep away till she'll dawn the better day. Bring it out, bring it out, bring it out, bring it out. Till the sinful world be one for Jehovah's mighty son. Bring it out, bring it out, bring it out, bring it out, bring out. Barely ring the world. Speed it away, Lord. Send it to